cares about me. These are the guys that need all the recognition. These are the guys that really sacrifice everything. This is just stupid blood. These guys risk their lives, their limbs, and everything. I was sitting at a desk at the kind of peak of the dot-com in California, working for a dot-com. I'm top 10 in the world. I have a few girls pregnant. I think I have AIDS. And I'm already planning what I'm going to be doing that weekend at another party with a different girl. So like the level of a piece of shit that I was is, is pretty indescribable. Watching a plane slam into a building, another plane slam into a building, and then I'm watching Americans walk up to a window and look down and try and decide if they're going to jump to their death or if they're going to burn alive. Like those are their two options. And like five minutes before that, I was literally debating in my mind what girl I'm going to hook up with and what pants, what jeans I'm going to wear. And um, that still wasn't rock bottom of me being a piece of shit. So uh, like to answer your question, that period is, is just a lot of shame. That was the start of the turn. That was, uh, that definitely started train trending where I started not being such an ethnocentric, like selfish piece of shit. But it was definitely not like, boom, Tim's a good person. Uh, my first deployments to Iraq, not a good person. You know, my first uh, special forces ODA that I show up at, you know, like I think I'm the best in the world and all these different things. I'm a brand new noob that knows nothing about anything. Definitely not a over, like overnight change, but it was the start of, man, I gotta do something. I don't think you can leave that stuff behind. Um, it just kind of comes part of you. You know, every, every human is a collection of their experiences, right? Their perspective and their biases and their, their opinions. Those are all shaped by the things that they've done in their life and those experiences. Oh man. So, I mean, the, the, my name's easy. It's Tim Kennedy. And what I do is, I mean, it's a disaster. Uh, so military wise, I'm a master sergeant in special forces and I'm um, 17 years working in the special operations community. Um, on the civilian side, I am part, uh, one of the founders of a humanitarian evacuation, uh, NGO where we go into war zones and help the people there and our allies and Americans that are trapped there to get them out. Um, I own a security consulting company, a defensive tactics training company, uh, a government contracting company. And uh, so I don't know, like put in the middle, I really like good people living and bad people not existing. All the things that go along with doing that is what I do. So I grew up in Central California, and when you hear California, you're like, oh, I was a surfer, we were like in Hollywood. No, I grew up in, in the central part, which is four hours from San Francisco and four hours from Los Angeles, and it's all wine, and it's all agriculture, and it's all cows, and all I grew up doing was fixing fence and fighting with people on the farms. Um, like. That was my life. We'd, yes, we could go to the beach when we weren't working, but the back was burnt from being in the sun. You had all these little cuts from hay. You know, your hands were always calloused and trashed from fixing fences. And uh, you had to speak crappy Spanglish because everybody that you worked with was, was Mexican. And um, like, that's, that's how I grew up. I grew up in, in extraordinary circumstances just because of the, like what my dad did and what my uncles did. And my, my dad was a narcotics officer and uh, undercover his whole entire career. 
And this was like peak war on drugs. You know, as we've grown up in this generation, we like know the war on terror and we know what that looked like. Well, there was an era where the war on drugs was really the emphasis of everything nationally. So, you know, like we're in Colombia and we're at obviously at the border and, and we're trying to um, interdict planefuls of cocaine. That was my dad. He'd go to Costa Rica, steal a, a plane of cocaine from Pablo Escobar. He'd fly, the, fly that plane to the United States. And then he would sell all of that cocaine to all of the distributors. And then when those distributors would go out to sell those things, then in one big movement, he'd arrest all of them. And he'd like go and he'd set up cameras and, and meth camps and he'd figure out how they cooked meth and all the different ingredients. And then he'd set up his own meth lab to cook meth and then figure out what other ingredients he could use so then they could restrict what kind of ingredients you could purchase to make meth. Like that was my dad. You know, or the red phone in the, in the closet, having his eight-year-old son sneak into parking garages to steal things out of glove boxes because he didn't have a warrant yet and he needed to know who owned, what drug dealer owned this car. And um, so like, it was an inspiration to who I, be, like, who I am. Yeah, but it, it wasn't just me. So my brother's an FBI bomb tech. He's a... He's an investigator, uh, detective sergeant. You know, my, my other brother works for the Department of Energy protecting nuclear material um, on the armed security side. My other brother is a Green Beret and uh, that was government contractor going overseas as, as kind of a mercenary. So like this, is that, like this is just how we grew up and it became very normal to be in very not normal circumstances. And you know, we could talk for hours and hours on what my dad and mom did, but really, they created an environment where extraordinary things, remarkable things seem normal. And at 15 years old, one of my best friends died in a car crash. Uh, my brother's best friend, his brother, was doing CPR on his own brother who was dying in his own arms. I was like, mom, 15, you know? So uh, remembering that, walking up to the door of my best friend's house, and seeing his mom, who I'd seen for the past 15 years, but it's not the same woman because it was emptiness behind her eyes and it was just dark. The mascara had just been running down her face. And walking down to my best friend's room, obviously he's not there because he's dead in the hospital. And like, I couldn't even cross the threshold. And uh, you know, like the, when I said I had an extraordinary childhood, like there are things that shaped who I am and how I became and the perspective and the approaches that I have and knowing my purpose. It was a refiner's fire to find it. So I had two very different experiences in war uh, in my first two deployments. The contrast could not be more significant. When special forces, the training and selection process is arduous, it is horrible. If you have 400 people that go to a selection class, you'll maybe get 25 that get selected to go to a year and a half of training. And then once they go to that year and a half of training, you probably lose about another 50%. So in the volume of bodies, like if you just start, like if you take a thousand people, you're gonna end up with 50 to 75 Green Berets and the thousand people that show up, these are, these are infantrymen. These are like the, they're triple volunteers. Like they volunteer to be in the military. They volunteered to go into combat arms and they volunteer to go selection. So these are like the who's who of in the military of people that want to become a Green Beret. And even of that population, you end up with just this tiny little group. So after the year and a half, of the Q course, the Q course is broken up into phases. So once you're selected at the special forces selection course, you then go to the Q course, which is the qualifying course. It's a year to a year and a half of learning how to shoot, move, communicate, and medicate, and then how to be a teammate and a member and understanding unconventional warfare, guerrilla warfare, and how to train uh, the people that we go overseas to train with. When I made it to the Special Forces ODA, I got um, fortunate to go to a special unit within special operations. And um, that first deployment was to Iraq and we were part of a task force that was hunting Zarqawi, who was the number one bad guy in Iraq and the number two bad guy on the planet behind Bin Laden. And um, the men that I, the men and women that we, that we were with, they are absolute hammers. I mean, these are like the best and brightest on the planet. And then there's this hairy-handed troll, me, that did not deserve to be there in any way, shape, or form. 
You know, we had 200 and something combat operations in this deployment as we're hunting this guy, Zarqawi, and none of us got hurt. I mean, it was just like overwhelming power of expertise and professionalism. And when you look at special missions units like, you know, the SEAL Team 6 and Delta Force, um, when all of those efforts are pointed at a singular entity, like that, that focus, that, and the, all the modalities that they've perfected, like all of that energy is like acute to this tiny little uh, point is nothing can stop it. And that, that's, that's what I was part of, the first deployment. It's pretty rad to be part of that. The next deployment, it's me and my sniper partner going to Afghanistan to be part of a, we, we were USASOC snipers, US Special Operations Command snipers. And we weren't there with a team, we were just two snipers that were gonna go support all of our coalition partners. So we have the Czech, the French, the British, all of their special operations, uh, you know, the, the SAS or the Canadian Special Forces, each of those units as they would go out, we would be this like uplift, like a bolt-on extra thing. So if, uh, you know, 30 Canadian Special Forces guys were gonna go out to do this operation, they would get two American Special Forces snipers to support that operation. One, we could, snipers not, are not just shooters, they're, they're an extra set of eyes for the commander. So we would be relaying back to American command, like what was happening on the ground. So sometimes there were accent problems uh, or like just language differences, um, even though everybody's speaking English, words can mean different things and words really matter in in war my partner um, when he got on the ground he found out that his wife had been waiting for him to leave and she had drained their bank accounts and was selling all their stuff so uh, when he got there his life is kind of a wreck so they pull him off and i end up by myself um, so i start doing all these missions with all these different coalition partners as a lone american so i'm with I go to Erzgan with the Czech Special Forces, and while we're there, we get blown up in an ambush that turns into a three-day gunfight where we're able to fight our way to Firebase Anaconda, which is a pretty fair, famous firebase because it was overrun by the Taliban multiple times. And uh, while we're there as a sniper, I mean, it is just, it is war, and, and war is the worst things that human can, humans can do to other humans. And um, like, there's a, there's a moment where I'm like covered in my, my own shit because we got blown up and I got overpressure. It's like, like brain injury. We're at altitude because we're trying to, we're going through these big, huge mountains where we're ambushed. Hadn't slept in a couple of days. I know how I no longer have any bullets and I'm on my belly trying to figure out where, what dead body I can crawl to, to find bullets. Like it was that kind of bad time. So very different experiences in war. Um, the Taliban, just as brutal as Al Qaeda. Um, but in the rural, um, austere environments of Afghanistan, that brutality is, is extra horrific. Oh, it's just a weird acute. You know, they um, throw an acid on little girls because they didn't think girls should go to school. Um, you know, the torture was normal to the Taliban as, as a way to show that they owned a village. Um, and that was, so Afghanistan and Iraq for me were very different things. Um, and those were my first two trips overseas to war in special forces. Very different. Nice. There's Sean J. Ribeiro in the black ski with the shaved head. Sean J. Ribeiro is the GOAT. So there's kind of three people that when you talk about who's the greatest grappler of all time, when you think about like Hoist Gracie, Helsing Gracie, Boiler Gracie, who I'm belted as a black boat under, you can't omit Sean J. Ribeiro. So Sean J. Ribeiro has more world titles than any grappler ever in the history of grappling. Padre Gracie's up there, Galvao is up there, Gordon Ryan competes only in no-gi. Um, he is the current number one best fighter on the planet. He chains on these mats too. Um, Sean Apperson right there in the green on green, he's matching. I don't know what that's about. He's usually a disaster of a human and especially with attire and fashion. Sean is an ex-professional fighter, black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, owner of Paragon Jiu-Jitsu, and um, owns boxing gyms. He is a monster. Um, next we have Tommy McKay, who is on top there in the white shirt. Tommy McKay is a fight to win competitor, a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu under Hoyler Gracie. And um, 
he, he definitely is going to be in like the top 10 type category. Under there is uh, Shane Steiner. He's a brown belt, should be black belt, but I promote solely because I'm a horrible person and a friend. He's one of my best Got friends. Lucas right here, another black belt. Tyson, another professional fighter. Um, the dude in the Hawaiian shorts, black, sh uh, the Brazilian, he's going to Miami to fight in Pan Ams this weekend. Pan Ams is like the big world championship for Gi Jiu-Jitsu. Who did I miss? I know I miss people, but that, like, that's just a quick overview of like, yeah. This is un unreal and wild. Okay. Um, Victor Hugo is another one that's supposed to come in. He's the number one heavyweight on the planet. And um, in, in gi jiu-jitsu, outside of Gordon, who's the number one on the planet for no gi. Yeah, I'm going to go grab Externally looking in, you see a special forces guy that is going to war, and then you see this MMA fighter. And like these are two very different things. To me, it's the same thing. You know, I was like, a warrior society, a warrior culture, I was just doing two different forms of combat, and um, I would have done both of them concurrently. The military had a hard time with allowing me to fight while I was on active duty. So if, if I had my cake and I could eat it too, I would have stayed in special forces, I would have stayed in that, stayed in that special missions unit, and I would have continued to fight. You know, I, I did it for a few years, and they didn't know about it until finally they're sitting there, they look up at the TV and they're like, that's one of our guys. Why is that guy on television, you know? <laughs> and uh, I got in trouble. Something magical happens when you train like that. When you go and compete, and I'm, I'm still competing, I'm recovering from two pretty bad injuries. Um, I got run over by Humvee, a motorcycle, and I was trying to throw a guy, so my, my had knee surgery. Um, when you go and compete, the winner gets his hand raised, and the loser stands there like this. There's no one on the mat. There's the ref that is showing who won. Next to him is the winner. And then there's you, the loser. There's, there's no one to pass blame on to. There's no one who's like, my coaches didn't do this. You know, like my strength trainer didn't do it. It is you. You are the sole person that dictated success or failure. You're the only person that gave you a win or a loss. And it's this powerful experience to be standing there and knowing that the total onus of responsibility is on my shoulders. You take that and you apply it to everything in life, whether it's being a good father, whether it's being a good employee, whether it's being a good entrepreneur and employer, whatever, that sole little tiny picture, it is all on you. You either got up early, you either worked hard, you either ate right, you either put in the outlet, or you didn't, and that guy did. It's on you. So this fucking generation, they see an Instagram photo and they see somebody standing on top of Mount Everest, picturesque, right? It looks like they're, on, they're nearly in space. And um, man, so cool, top of Everest, top of the world, right? What they didn't see was the training of crotch rot, where that person's sweating, you know, in, in lower altitudes and heat and, uh, you know, getting the bottom of their feet falling off from gross water immersion and exposure where they have like chunks of their face and neck that are just falling off from the cold weather or their nose which is partially missing they, they don't see any of that stuff they just see a single moment so i think the two most compelling things that shape a person are failure and shame and uh my life is packed with shame and failure um, i'm not saying you have to rush to failure but people are so scared of failure now and you, know, you hear all these same things like Michael Jordan would have scored so many, so many points um, had he not taken all those shots. Or Babe Ruth wouldn't have hit all those home runs unless he stepped up to the plate. And they're all so irritating because they're all so cliche. But they were there, right? They did strike out. They did fail. They, they were like not even considered to come on and play for their high school team because they weren't good enough. And every one of those moments, if you go back to me as a baby, where the doctor is looking at me and he's, and he's saying, you have a heart murmur, to my parents, you have a heart murmur so terrible, we either have to do surgery or you're gonna be a decrepit child for the rest of your life. That was me as a baby. My parents were torn between this decision. So it's for me, two, three, four, five, six, I was the smallest, I was the weakest 
Like, would I have ever gotten there had I not been humiliated, had I not been shamed, had I not struggled, and had I not failed, had I not been in the drink? And now in 2022, where everybody wants comfortable and everyone, you know, we're complacent, uh, you know, hard made, hard men make good times, good times make weak men, weak men make hard times. Like, we're, we're living that. We're like, you know, I, I want hard men again. You know, I want people that are fierce, passionate people. And, uh, because I know what success looks like and how you get it and how it's garnered is through suffering and failure and shame. Everybody's scared. You know, everybody is fearful of failure. Um, but nobody has experienced adversity like the military. Nobody has faced their adversary with more vicious visceral, not just anger, but like passion for success for the people to your left and to your right. And I don't know what happens where, you know, when you become a veteran and you're no longer in active duty, where you forget what that feels like. You remember the good times, you know, you remember um, the experience and the feeling of coming back sweaty and being able to take your body armor off for the first time and how wonderful that breath of air conditioned air felt for the first time. But those aren't the things that you should remember. You should actually remember the suffering and you should, remember, you should remember how scared you were. But even though you're that scared and even, even though you're, you're in the most horrific experience imaginable, you still moved your feet forward. You still did what you're supposed to do. And that, that is something remarkable, but you don't remember that. You have to remember that. You have to stop and take a second and value what you did for the people to your left and to your right and the fact that you still moved your feet forward, even though everything around you was telling you to stop, find cover, lay down, and cower. You didn't. One of the many reasons why I love the military and love the veteran community is because their experiences are unique. You know, we're talking about less than 1% of society serves in the military and way less than that in combat arms. Um, you know, where you saw my friend Toby walk up and I was like, it's, it's an embrace and somebody that I haven't seen in six months. And, but we have something, we have a connection there. And that connection is service, you know, an, an, entry, an infantryman that literally like had to fight a dude with a tomahawk. Um, and uh, so we could not see each other for 10 years and I'll still like hug him like my best friend in the world. Um, it changes you, not for the better, not for the worse. Just, it's a change, it's a lens, it's a, it's like a filter that I wish I could look at the, the world through rose colored lenses, but now it's just always tarnished and blurry because I know what a human can do to another human. And that's a pretty terrible thing. All, all the military and veterans out there, you're badass motherfuckers. Like you have skills that the best, wisest, most experienced business person on the planet wishes that they had. You have discipline, you understand how to regiment your life. You know, you, the little things, um, when Mattis said, what's the most important thing that you can do when you wake up? He's like, you can make your bed. You learn that in the military. You learn how to do small incremental decisions and those cumulative incremental decisions added up matter. And it starts this, this, this wave of effectiveness and productivity that nobody can compete with because we know how to work. We know how to get up early. We know how to stay up late. We know that time doesn't matter, that getting the job done and getting mission complete and mission success is all that matters, especially for entrepreneurs. Like the military and veteran community, you were given this gift of knowing how to do superhuman things. You just have to go and do them. You know, if you set that sword down, if you forget who you were and what you could do, what it felt like to get up at five o'clock in the morning, so. You could grab a little bit of bite to eat before you go and train for two hours, before you go up to work and, sh and work for 10 hours training to go to deploy six months later, or you then deploy for a year. You know, like that was the, the recipe for success was given to you. You just have to believe it and then you have to do it. Train, you know, the, uh, the forging of, that we'd grab anything off this table you know, and they, every single one of those things was forged through this, this arduous, violent process. You know, the, the refiner's fire, you take a thing, and it's an impure, broken, imperfect thing. You stick it in there, you take it out, and you pound it. 
and you stick it back in there, you pull it out and you pound it. And you stick it in the water, you stick it back in there and you pound it. And ultimately, it becomes to take a shape. And that shape serves a purpose. You know, you can go and you can cut down corn. You know, and you can feed your family with it. You can dig with it. Whether it's a shovel, whether it's a knife, whether it's a sword, all of them kind of are very similar in the process in which they, they were made. Like a scalpel can save life and it can take life, but it's still forged the same way. So the hu I think humans are no different. Like the mind has to be forged. The body has to be forged. That approach to fear has to be forged. Or yeah, man, I'm scared. Like I'm scared to death, but I'm still gonna put my foot forward and try and be able to do something. And that just doesn't happen. You don't rise to the occasion. You fall to your level of training. So how are you training? It doesn't matter what kind of adversity you face. It doesn't matter what kind of failure you succumb to. It doesn't matter how many times you miss the mark. It doesn't matter how many times you were the loser. Because like, I don't know if you could be more of a loser than me. I don't know if you could fail more than me. I don't know, insert any one of those like motivating moments and you're like, dude, that guy was pathetic. So here, I'm still moving that foot forward. Somebody, if you want a picture, if you want to throw a Sean G, good luck. I'm gonna do this till the day I die. I'm gonna be super clear. Like when, when I'm finally dead and at whatever point that is where I would get blown up in combat or, or um, you know, like just of old age and the wheels fall off and the windows are smashed and the door is just totally broken, the, the engine's on fire, the transmission's grinding, I pull up to the pearly gates and they look at me and they're like, bro, I can't let this car in here. And I was like, well, there's, this is how I ran it. So I ran hard in the paint, you either let me in or you don't, but this, this, this hunk of junk is gonna sit here until you make a decision. Like, I'm gonna do this forever. I'm never gonna set the sword down. Um, I have been so blessed to know why I'm, why I'm here. You know, like, I am so fortunate to, to, to understand my purpose. And um, it would be a wasted life if I did not stay on course forever. I thought I was supposed to be, there's a period where I thought I was supposed to be the world champion. And that was a really selfish world where all the meals were about me, all the training sessions were about me, you know, the fight camp was about me, where we were living was about me, you know, my family was not just second seat, like they're, they're in the trunk, you know, because like if you're going to be the world champion, everything else is sacrificed to be that. And, um, but that wasn't my purpose. Like it was, it was part of it. Like I'm, I was supposed to be, I'm supposed to be a warrior. I'm supposed to work. I'm supposed to have discipline. It's, my life is supposed to be regimented and all of those tools are supposed to be carry over to be able to preserve and protect human life and do good and protect people. Right. Um, but I, I was like off the mark and, and you know, my family suffered because of that. My businesses suffered because of that. But then once like that adjustment and alignment was made, knowing where I'm supposed to be and what I'm supposed to be doing, you know, like, there's nothing more rewarding than being in line with your purpose. It is a fulfilling, beautiful thing when you're like doing what you're supposed to be doing. I love, I love anything that is not fun to do. Um, I love cryotherapy. I love ice baths. I love cold water swims. Um, when uh, that super dark moment where I had a bunch of women pregnant, I thought I had AIDS. There, what I did is I walked to the Pacific Ocean, I took all my clothes off, and I started swimming due west into the fog for a couple miles. You're like, I'm not trying to kill myself, I'm just trying to, to be right. And um, the, there's something about cold that, that gets you right. You know, you get out of that water and everything else, because you just voluntarily chose to put yourself through something that 
physically is super good for you. You know, it's, it's great for inflammation, um, like all of the hormones that are pumping through your body the moment you get out of that water, all super positive things. But more importantly, you, by choice, submerged yourself you know, in like the baptism of suffering. And you, every second that you're sitting in there, you're just like, I can get out at any time. But I am choosing to stay in here. I just want to say a massive thank you to Tim Kennedy for his time on this project. We managed to squeeze it in, but unfortunately, we did not manage to squeeze in the offer from Tim of Texas barbecue and playing with some of Tim's toys. Um, so next time we're in Texas, Tim, I would love to do something else. So thank you so much for your time. Um, and all of this was made possible by MulliganBrothers.com, where you can buy the hardest worker in the room t-shirt. The help that you guys and the support that you guys give us to be able to fly our film crew our cameras uh, all the way to Texas on the other side of the world for us to be able to film Tim and share this message with everybody. Um, so thank you so much to everybody who has supported us on mullenbrothers.com. If you want to support the channel, you can click the join button down below and also hit that notification bell, guys. Get notified of these videos. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with somebody. Share Tim's message with other people. Have a blessed and productive day and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.